Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society's talk about Lord Ashburton and his Somerset estates. My name's Lizzie Indooney and I'm a trustee for Sands and also chair of the Historic Buildings Committee of Sands. Today we're going to hear a talk about Lord Ashburton uh, by David Victor. David moved to Somerset some 12 years ago and decided to replace his botanical research with historical research, particularly local history. Since then, he's concentrated on the people and villagers near his home in Chapel Lee, Lydiard St. Lawrence. He's previously carried out studies on the Perriam family of Milverton, the Turbervilles of Golden Manor, Tolland, the Marriott family of Hestercombe, and the Starwell family of Cothelston and Loham. He's currently working on an extensive study of the manor and borough of Milverton and other manors such as Preston Bowyer and Preston Torrells. Talks and papers have been produced on most of these subjects. In today's lecture, to make things simple, David is taking questions at the end of the talk. To ask questions, you will need to activate the chat button at the bottom of the page and type in the question. To find, find the button, just run the mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three dots. Because we're recording this lecture, we won't use names in the question time. It's free to register for the talks, but a donation of five pounds towards the ongoing costs of SANS would be greatly appreciated. The donations button is on the SANS website donations page. When donating, please label your donation Ashburton. To make things easier, a link to the donations page will also be posted on the chat button at the end of the lecture. So, over to David. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session about Lord Ashburton's estate in uh, West Somerset. During the 19th century, a large estate was created um, spanning the villages and towns of Wibberliscombe, Milverton, uh, Fitzhead, Preston Boyer, and parts of Lydiard St. Lawrence. It was assembled in the 1820s, and at the end of the uh, century, it was taken down again and, and dispersed into individual farms. Now I say it's a large estate, and I should point out that when I say a large estate, um, I'm talking about an agricultural estate, a large agricultural estate, not one of the kinds of estates that you find in um, Scotland and the north of England, which were game estates and were very extensive. But in agricultural terms, solidly farms, this estate was a large one. What I'd like to do this afternoon is talk to you about how those estates were put together, um, the people that assembled them, and particularly the Beedham family. Then I'd like to go on and talk about Lord Ashburton, who was the uh, buyer of the estate, and how the estates were managed, and finally, how the whole thing came to a rather sticky end. Anyway, um, I'd like to start by showing you a photograph um, of the courtroom at Fitzhead Court. Now, in calling this a courtroom, I mean a courtroom in the sense that a, manor, a manor would call a courtroom. It's not a court of law. It's a court where the leader of the manor, the uh, Lord Farmer, as it would be in a, a religious manor, um, called together his tenants um, to issue land, to receive land that had been surrendered, and to do all of the management of the land over the estate altogether. This particular one was built in the mid 17th century um, by a man called Robert Cannon. And the Cannon family lived in this house at the time. They didn't actually own the estate, they lived in the estate. Anyway, he rebuilt the house, and this is the courtroom where those meetings were held. And over the years, most of the people I'll be talking about this afternoon use that courtroom for managing their estates at one time or another. And that includes Southey in the first place, Canon Southey, then Lord Somerville, 
uh, then Richard Beden for some time, and finally a man called James Knollis, who, who I'll come to in a minute. And I'd like to thank Nancy Hunt, the current owner of this um, room and house, um, for her permission to take this photograph and use it. So, to the talk proper, um, I'd like to start by talking about the manner of, of um, Wiveliscombe and Fitzhead, which is the key central part of Lord Ashburton's estate. So, the church manor of Wiveliscombe and Fitzhead existed from pre-Norman times right up until the end of our story. It was a church manor, that is, it was there to provide funds for the church, uh, both in terms of produce and in terms of finance. And I'd compare that to most manors, which were military manors and were concerned with providing um, arms and people to fight wars originally. Though of course, over time, these, these uses of manners varied. I say this church manor belonged to the diocese of Bath and Wells, and in fact was divided into three parts, three sub manors. The largest part belonged to the bishop. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and then there was a Prebendor Manor belonging to the Prebend of, of Wells and a Dean and Chapters Manor, um, which was actually the Oakhampton estate on the borders of Fitzhead and um, Wibbeliscombe. But by far the largest was the Church Manor, uh, sorry, the Bishop's Manor, which was something like 5,000 acres. Ever since um, Elizabethan times, the manor, the manor had been le uh, leased out to a third party who carried out the management of the manor. Um, the person who had that task was called the Lord Farmer, and we'll come across that term again later. Um, the lease, the, sorry, the basis of the lease was a 21 year lease um, with renewals every seven years. Um, it was based also on lives, like many leases were at that time, we'll come back to that later, and the lives involved in this particular one were three fairly elderly and senior people, and the holder of the lease, the lessee, was Lord Coventry. And he paid what was known as a customary rent for the entire manor of £80 a year and that was unchanged from Elizabethan times. Now, our story really begins in 1800, and at that time, the bishop who held the manor was Bishop Charles Moss, the chap on the left-hand side of this group of um, bishops, and he was 90 years old. And sadly, he was having rather a difficult argument with Lord Coventry about various aspects of the manor. And in particular, they couldn't come to an agreement. One life had died and a fine had to be paid to the bishop to replace that life by another life. And they couldn't agree on the size of that, of that fine. Also, there was an argument over how the timber on the manor should be used, who should be able to um, obtain an element of it. Anyway, this argument was quite heated, um, and Bishop Moss, who was 90 years old, rather an old man, um, he didn't very much like that argument, and what's more, he didn't want to prejudice his successor, who he realised must come fairly soon. So he let the manor uh, lease extend for a couple of years until he died in 1802. And at that point, Bishop Beden came to the fore. He was the new bishop in Bath and Wells. Um, and for the first decade, he was far too busy to worry too much about the manor and he just let the lease roll on in the way it had been rolling on. However, in 1813, he decided it was time that he sorted this matter out once and for all. So he dug out the papers, um, 
and realized that a second life had now died. So the fine to renew the two lives will be much greater than the fine for one life. So he talked to Coventry about it. Again, they couldn't come to an agreement. In the end, he thought the best um, approach was basically to cancel the lease and to pay Lord Coventry off, which is exactly what he did. He paid Coventry 10,000 pounds, um, took the lease back in house, took the papers with it. But then, of course, he had to find somebody to look after the manor for him. And um, he had a son, another Richard Beaton, who was a recently retired captain from the army. And he thought a fine idea would be to get his son to become Lord Farmer, which he did. And then he thought, well, as he's Lord Farmer, we might as well lease the manor to him. So he leased the manor to his son. Um, again, on a 21 year lease, uh, very similar to the lease to the one that Coventry had had, except that he could now apply three different lives to it. And he chose to apply his three children. So he had three very young lives who would outlast the 21 years, as it were. Beaton carried on in his seat for some time and Richard Beaton carried on managing the manor, manor for some years until in 1824, Bishop Beaton died and was replaced by Bishop Law. Now, in the meantime, Richard Beaton had been looking at what was happening elsewhere and saw there were a number of cases where the church had, a bishop had disposed of his manor to some third party in terms of a sale rather than a lease. And he thought, that seems a pretty good thing to do. Um, and he went to see George Law and said, I'd like to buy the manor. And George Law said, no, 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 this is a church manor, we don't do that kind of thing. Um, anyway, he put as much pressure on as he could. And in the end, Law decided that probably it was in both their interests that he did it. And we'll come back to that later. Anyway, in 1827, I think, um, Law sold the manor to Richard Beaton. Now, Richard Beaton was a, um, an ambitious man and had a rather, his, he married very well into a, a rich family. And I think, um, he had wealthy in-laws and he wanted to, uh, you know, get him well with them. So he started looking around for ways of extending this manor to other uses, to other people. Now I have to take you back in history at this point. Um, in the middle of the previous century, the house we saw, the, we saw just now, uh, with its uh, um, courtroom, was occupied by a man called Canon Southey. Um, the Canon family who had owned the, um, the house had come there, had lost, sorry, had run out of sons, and they'd come down to two female co-heirs. And John Southey came down from Bristol, married one of the heirs, moved into, or heiresses, I should say, moved into the house, um, and they had a child who was Canon Southey. Canon Southey became, in time, a very successful lawyer um, based in Taunton with a, um, a business which stretched through West Somerset and East Devon and overlapped into London in places. And he became quite wealthy out of um, this practice and used the money to buy land. That was his choice of using his, uh, making his investments. And that was not unusual at the time because other investment vehicles weren't easily available. So he bought farms. He bought three in Lydia and St. Lawrence. Um, he bought Hockham Farm, Piley Farm, and Holford Farm in Lydia and St. Lawrence. He bought the Manor Farm of um, Preston Torrells in Preston Boyer. He bought Nunnington Park Farm, which is on the borders of uh, Wibbeliscombe and, and uh, Milton, And he bought a number of others which were further afield. 
But altogether, he amassed a large land holding of several hundred acres. And there was a question as he drew towards the end of his life about what would happen to that um, estate, because his wife had predeceased him, as had his daughter, his only child. So he didn't have a direct heir. But he had two possibilities. He had cousins from another line of the family, male cousins, who were living in Holford Farm, the farm that he owned. And he had a sister. His sister, Mary, had married um, a man called Christopher Lethbridge. Um, they'd had a daughter who, by this time, was moving into uh, uh, the, the same house as uh, Canon Sully, sharing another part of it. Um, and they had a son in 1765. And that was about the time that um, Canon Sully was making his will. And he chose, rather than leaving his estate to his cousins in Holford Farm, who had expected it, to leave it to his grand great nephew, John Southey Somerville, the newly born child. And what he did was he left his estate in trust um, for his great nephew. The result of that was that um, when he did die in 1768, uh, his cousins immediately went to the Chancery Court to try and have the will put aside. And as we all know from having read Dickens in earlier years, once you get into the Chancery Court, you can't get out again. Um, they went to Chancery in 1769 and stayed there until the end of the century, until they got a settlement. And the settlement they got at the end of the century was some furniture and some plate. They didn't get the estate at all. That went to our next man, John Southey Somerville. And back to the visuals. Oops, move it on one. Go on, move on. That's it. John Southey Somerville. This is the man handsome looking young man in his Somerset Yeomanry uniform. He was Colonel of the West Somerset Yeomanry, um, which of course was a, a territorial unit. Um, and he was interested in soldiering, uh, soldiering. in fact, wrote a, a book about uh, how, how everybody should do their part in the Yeomanry. And he also provided the land for Wellington's um, monument in Wellington. But primarily he was a farmer. He took the estate that um, he'd been left by Southey and added to it and managed it. Um, and he did very well. He was an improving farmer. One of the group that there were at the early, you know, the change of the 18th to the 19th centuries of people who were trying to improve agriculture. He became president of the Board of Agriculture for England, and he became president of the Bath and West um, organization. His agricultural improvements were things like he invented the first two share plow that was used in this country. He invented um, a new suspension for carts to make um, carts be able to turn more easily. He uh, introduced merino sheep into the country and improved them did all kinds of things. And through these, he got to know other improving farmers um, spread around the large estates in England. And through that, he got to know um, farmer George, George III, um, and became a courtier and became uh, Lord of the King's bedchamber in time. So he was a su successful man in many different fields, but primarily a farmer. He farmed the farms that he'd inherited and added to them, as I said, um, but he also did one other thing, and that is in Preston Boyer, next to the farm that he did own there, Preston Torrells, was another estate called Preston Boyer Manor, which was another church estate. And this one belonged to the Dean and Canons, uh, canons of um, St George's Chapel, Windsor. They not surprisingly, as uh, with, with the bishops of, of Bath and Wells, 
were having trouble with their current lessee. Um, and Somerville persuaded them that they'd be better off if, um, if he looked after it rather than, than, than uh, leaving it with them. So he took on the uh, Preston Boyer farm, which was another 600 odd acres, um, giving him altogether about um, 12, 1300 acres under his own management. He died in 1819, um, and his heir was um, his brother, because, sorry, he didn't have a, a family, he'd never become married, never been married, died in his 50s, um, I should say that. He died on a tour of Europe um, with dysentery, surprising. I've never heard of anybody doing that before, but anyway, um, poor man, that's what happened. His brother was the inheritor um, and was not at all keen on farming. He was a, a proud Scot. Some of the title is a Scottish title. He was a proud Scot with the estates in Scotland. He also had estates in Wiltshire and he liked spending quite a lot of time in London. He was one of those wealthy Scots of the time, um, landowning Scots. And he wasn't at all keen on uh, becoming a West Country gentleman farmer. Now, luckily, um, the estate had gone into uh, a short-term trust under a guy called John George Trevelyan of Nettlecombe, who was the prebend of Taunton. Now, and he knew um, Richard Beaton, uh, not surprisingly, they only lived a few miles apart. And the two got together quite quickly and a way was found for um, selling the Somerville estates to Richard Beaton so he could add them to his pile. So by 1925, Richard Beaton had amassed not only uh, Wibbeliscombe and Fitzhead, um, but he'd also amassed the Southey um, estates, mainly through um, parts of Lydiard St. Lawrence, Preston Boyer and uh, Milverton. And those estates are the ones that eventually passed to Lord Ashburton. So I think it's, oh, I should say, up until that time, uh, Richard Beaton had only spent £70,000. The purchase of the um, original manor of Wibbeliscombe and Fitzhead cost just over £36,000, and the Somerville and Southey estates another twenty-four. So altogether, he spent about £70,000 to, to put this estate together. I think it's time now to go and look on it, um, start getting a view of, of Lord Ashburton, or as he's known at the uh, early part of his li life, Alexander Baring. He was the grandson of a guy called Johann Baring, who, whose um, stepfather, had sent to England from Germany, from Bremen, to learn the wool trade. So Johann came to London, came to Exeter, in fact, to learn the wool trade, because that was a major um, exporting um, site for wool. He settled in there, did quite well, um, found himself an attractive young lady with a large fortune. Um, and became wealthy and settled and didn't think about ever going back to Germany again. Um, he had three sons and two daughters, and two of the sons, um, Francis and John, when they were ready to kind of flee the nest, decided they didn't want to stay in the wool trade in Exeter. They'd rather exit to um, the city of London, become general merchants in London. So they went to London and they formed a company called um, John and Francis Bearing. And then a few years later, Francis' eldest son, Alexander Bearing, um, was ready to work. And Alexander was sent to Holland to learn his trade to a company called Hope & Co. Hope & Co were um, the most successful and largest bankers in Europe at the time particularly specialising, or sorry, in the world probably, uh, particularly specialising in raising finance for governments, 
they were very enormous at that work. Whereas Bering were looking much more to, to ordinary merchantry at the time. Anyway, Alexander was sent to Holland and he spent two years learning the banking trade in Holland. And then returned to England um, to work with his father and uncle. And at the time, that company, John and Francis Bering, was starting to morph into a bank and become Bering's Bank, as it became later. So Alexander came back at the right time, bringing his banking skills. However, he wasn't just a banker. Banking was his first line. He was also a politician. He spent 30 years in Parliament, the first 20 years of which were in Taunton, where he was a Whig MP. Following that, he spent a few years in Cornwall, in a, a, a constituency called Carrington, if I remember correctly, and then a few more years up in East Anglia. Um, I forget where there. Anyway, altogether, he, he did 30 years. And towards the end of his political career, um, he served in the Peel short government of 1834-5. Uh, this was a, a government that only lasted nine months. Um, and where he converted to a Tory rather than a Whig uh, and got his first ministerial appointment. He became Minister of Trade um, for 1834 and 5, and with that came the role of Master of the Mint. And at 1835, he decided to retire, and Peel, um, presumably to thank him, uh, decided to make him Lord Ashburton. And he took the name, it's quite interesting, his uncle had been Lord Ashburton of the first creation, um, and his, that, that one's son had been the second Lord of the first creation, but in fact the, life had, the line had died out at that point. So Alexander Berry was able to take the title again, um, except he became the first Lord of the second creation, but it kept the name going in the family. So here we have a man who's a banker and he's a politician. <coughs> the obvious extra bow to his string will be to make him a statesman as well. And that happened. Part of it happened before he did these two things and part of it happened afterwards. Um, but these two particular issues, which are, he's probably best known for in his life, um, topped and tailed his career. The first was called the Louisiana Purchase. At the beginning of the 19th century, America was, sorry, the uh, United States as we know it now, was divided into three portions. In the East, there was the United States of America. In the middle was the French territory called Louisiana. And to the West, there was the Spanish territories. Now, Louisiana was not just the state of Louisiana, it was all the white area shown on this map. It was the river valleys of the Mississippi and the Missouri. Um, stretching from the Canadian border right the way down to New Orleans. At this time, um, Napoleon was fighting a number of wars and was short of capital, needed money, because wars cost money. And at the same time, he had um, lands in America which were costing him money. So he came up with a, uh, a fiendish plan, as one might say. He decided to sell the American lands to help finance his um, wars. However, he didn't feel he could do it himself. He needed a third party for that because he needed somebody to raise the money that would be needed. And he went to Hope and Co in Holland and said, can you help me with this um, opportunity? And Hope and Co said yes, and then they went to Bearings and said, can we be partners? Because Bearings have very good relations with the United, United States, as the two brothers are both married American heiresses. So the two companies got together and said, yes, we'll do it for you. Um, and they chose as their um, negotiator, Alexander Bearing, as he was then, young man in his late 20s. <clears throat> 
and Alexander went off to France. Um, and his first thing he did was negotiate down the, the French demand, which was 100 million gold French francs to 80 million French francs. Uh, then he went to America and talked to the Americans. Um, and they agreed to pay it, but they said they couldn't afford all the 100 million because the French owed them, uh, 80 million, because the French owed them so much money. Um, so they decided that they'd pay 60 and the other 20 million would be written off against the debts of the French. So it would clear their debts. Um, Alexander then returned to Europe, went to saw the two partner banks, and they raised the money to finance Napoleon. And the end result of this really was that America was really very pleased because the United States became virtually twice the size they had been before, took them right over to the um, Spanish countries, uh, territories. Um, the French were very pleased because they had sufficient money to carry on fighting battles. Uh, and Hope and Cohen Bearings were very pleased because they walked away with a rather large check. Um, it's said to be three million pounds, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but um, that was the rumor at the time. Um, the only people probably who were slightly irritated about it were the English government, but bankers in those days didn't worry too much about governments, I don't think. Anyway, so from that, he became, became a very important statesman and was seen as a, as a really um, outstanding man which led to him becoming the chairman of the bank. The second issue came at the end of his career in 1842, when the English government asked him to go to America to negotiate with Daniel Webster, the um, Secretary of State, a frontier between Canada or Canada to be and America. Um, this was primarily a problem in the east and the border of Maine, um, where the Americans had the claim of the blue line on this map, the British had the claim of the red line on this map, and after a number of negotiations, a yellow line was agreed on. But more importantly, in some ways, it also led to um, an agreement on the joint use of the Great Lakes, which has been extremely important since, because there was no agreement up until that time about um, access and use of the Great Lakes between the countries. It also introduced extradition um, of, for major crimes um, uh, between the two countries. And there were also some uh, agreements on joint anti-slaving activities, which in the main were that there would be patrols up and down the west coast of Africa. But in fact, they really didn't go very far. There were a few, but nothing very serious. So at this point, we come to the, uh, the end of explaining who, who Ashburton is, because I think it's useful to know who your, your friends are, um, and move on to the deal between um, the Bedens and the Ashburton, and Ashburton. And the interface between those two is this man. This is William Frederick Beaton, who was the son of Richard Beaton. He was a, a fine upstanding Victorian gentleman, as you can see here. Um, he was a lawyer by training, as you can also see here, because the books down the right-hand side of the picture are all law tomes. Um, and he liked obviously being shown next to those. And after he'd finished what we're going to talk about in a moment, he um, went to London and became the senior magistrate uh, in the metropolitan area. So he was clearly a very competent lawyer. Um, anyway, some in 1838, some 10 years after the state had all been finally put together, um, Richard Beaton, gave the estate to William Frederick Beden. Um, William Frederick Beden quite quickly sold it to Lord Ashburton. And he sold it to Lord Ashburton for almost exactly 100,000 pounds. Um, 60,000 for Wibbleskin and Fitzhead, which originally cost 36,000. 
um, 28,000 for the Somerville and Southern Estates, and 8,500 to get the fag end of the uh, Preston Boyer Estate, although that stayed as a, as a leased estate because it was a church, still owned by the uh, church. The other thing that's interesting about this man is he was a lifelong um, Freemason. He belonged to numerous uh, Freemasonry lodges, and there was one named after him, and that lodge is still going, even though he's long dead, which I think is just an interesting point. Anyway, at this point, the Bedens, Bishop Beden, Richard Beden, and William Frederick Beden leave our tale, really. And we go on with, um, so what did Ashburton do next? Right. Ashburton inherited the estate, and the first thing he did was to put it into trust for his male heirs in perpetuity. And he set up a formal trust into which the estate went uh, with the board of trustees, and the land stayed in that trust until it was broken up finally at the end of the century. And as time went past, new trustees came in as other trustees died off. Um, it was absolutely classical Victorian trust in that sense. However, one of the attributes of that is great stability in terms of, of looking after the asset, because the trustees don't want to change it very much. They're bound by the rules of the trust about what they can do. Um, and it would have had things in there about how they would dispose of income that came from it and how they would deal with land and the rest of it. So, it's a very good way of giving stability to, to any state. The next thing is the manor management. There was no intention ever of the Ashburtons managing the estate on a day-to-day -day basis. What they wanted was a steward to manage it. And um, the first Lord Ashburton chose a man called James Knollys as his steward. And James Knollys stayed in that position for 40 years. And what's more, he trained his son to take over from him when he died, Cyprian. So there was a very stable management um, level, supported by a clerk, a, a man called Henry Copestake, who for many years was their clerk. Now, I think those two thing, things gave, on the one hand, stability from the ownership, and then consistency of management at the bottom in terms of um, reaching long-term goals for the estate. And I think both of those things were very good in terms of, of keeping the estate going well over time. The next aspect I'd like to just talk about is land reorganisation. At the end of the previous um, century, a man called John Billingsley wrote a book called um, A General View of Agriculture in Somerset, which was a, a critical review of um, land management in Somerset compared to uh, its peer counties. So compared to Wiltshire, Devon, Dorset, and uh, Gloucestershire. And what he did was break Somerset up into a number of similar chunks, homogenous chunks, such as the levels and the Western Hills and things like that. Um, looked at each of, the, of those in turn and compared them to things in these other four counties. And at the end of the day, was extremely critical about the way things were done in Somerset compared to the rest. It was very poor, had very good land, but it was very badly managed. And he put forward a whole raft of, of um, improvements that should be made to improve agriculture in Somerset. And James Knollys clearly picked up on this and in one particular way, and that was over the size of farms. The farms in um, Milverton and Fitzhead and the farms in Preston Boyer um, were derivative farms of old medieval manors. And that meant they typically were aimed at farmers where the relationship was father, mother, and eldest son, and the farm was a small holding run in that way. Um, 
and this was done by um, copyhold tenancies, um, which work in that way, th typically three life things. And typically the, the farms were 20 to 40 acres in size. And this is a, a period at which people are leaving the land. Industri uh, the Industrial Revolution is taking place. Um, mechanization is coming into farms and small farms can't exist in that kind of environment. That's why small holdings have disappeared to a great extent. Um, they need to have capital and skilled people to run the farms. And it's not very well done by a, a husband, his wife and his eldest son necessarily. And they certainly don't have the capital to do it. So Nolly's, on behalf of the trust, reorganised the land over time so that the average size of the farm went up to about 150 to 250 acres by the time the estate was broken up. And what's more, he moved away from these little copyhold tenancies into conventional leases based on a period of life and no, life, no lives involved. And I think that meant that by the, by the end of the trust existence, they had something that was much more saleable than what they had at the beginning. The final thing I pick up in this was um, the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical commissioners. Um, back in the 1830s, after the uh, Great Reform Act and the Slavery Act and the others, um, there was a reform act for the Church of England's finances put together, which um, concerned the ecclesiastical commissioners. They were charged with reorganizing the um, structure and finance of the Church of England to make it viable for the future and to do away with some of the corruption of the past. Um, and one of the things that they decided uh, as time went on through the century was that they'd sell off some of the uh, manners that they had so that they could do away with small income each year and have significant sums of capital which they could get then use to do the reforms they needed inside the church. And in 1890 they came to the trust and said we'd like to sell you the, the uh, Preston Boyer Manor and they sold it to them for £6,700. So by that time all of the land inside the entire estate was owned rather than leased. Now, in parallel with all of this, um, Bearings Bank was, um, was racing along. It did very well in uh, North America. And then, like many other entrepreneurial people in, uh, in Europe, they saw there were great possibilities in South America. And to a great extent, Bearings led the chase into Argentina in particular. Um, investing large sums of money on industrial projects there and lending money. However, it all went wrong. Um, in 1890, there was a major financial crisis in Argentina, which flew back into London very quickly. The peso went under tremendous pressure. Everything went broke. It came back into London and there was chaos there in the finance and bearings went broke. Um, they were rescued by a group of other banks because the Bank of England said they were far too big to fail. They were the most important bank in London. Um, and that was the first of their losses. Of course, they lost it a few years ago. A similar kind of thing happened. Um, anyway, the result of that was that the bearings family were very badly hit financially. And they decided the only thing to do was to sell off estates um, break all the entails so that um, they, they weren't going on to future generations. They needed the money today and everything was sold. Um, and for the West Somerset estate, they got about 150,000. So one could say in capital terms, they did well over the time, paid 100,000 and sold it for 150, but I don't think that's really the, uh, the tale. There's a couple of questions I'd like to just pick up on. Um, we've been through the tale of the estate. The first is, why did Lord Ashburton buy this estate? Um, 
Well, we know that he was Member of Parliament for Taunton for 20 years, up until 1826. And while he was doing that, he also did a couple of other things in the area. He, um, he bought the ties and the abels and everything else of um, St Mary Magdalene in Taunton for £9,000, which gave him a steady income from there. Um, he bought the reversions to the Hestercoon estate. Miss War, the last female heir of the wars, um, had been left enormous debts by her father, which she was determined to clear. Um, and she started selling off everything inside, apart from the home estate. She sold all her land in one big auction. And even on the home estate, sold a reversion. That is, that if she died without heirs, then whoever had the reversion could have the home estate. And secretly, um, Ashburton bought that reversion. So one could have put a story together that um, in the 1820s, Ashburton was thinking of moving to Taunton. However, I just don't think it hangs together in terms of buying the new estate because in 1826, his period as a, an MP did, uh, finished and he went off to Cornwall to be one. Um, and he didn't come back to Taunton in that sense. And that was long before buying the, um, the West Somerset estate in the late 1830s, 1840. Um, and what's more, he had an enormous pad already. He had um, the Grange in Hampshire, which is one of the most luxurious houses in the world, well, palaces in the world, I suppose, uh, with two or 3,000 acres around it. Um, so I, my view is that he bought it merely as a, an investment. He had no intention of ever living in the estate or using the estate, no personal interest in it at all. It was just a nice long-term investment for his family that he could leave them after he died. So that's, I think, my view of, of, um, of Ashburton. The other question is, why did the Beden sell the estate to Ashburton in the first place? Um, putting it together in the first place, the, the, obtaining the uh, Wibbeliscombe and Fitzhead part of it, the first major part of the estate, um, they rather strained um, credulity. Uh, the, the bishop who sold it to them put together some notes at the, um, which were published with the Act of Parliament to sell the estate. Um, that, that with, it's hard to, hard to think what they were. I mean, they, they effectively said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to set prices for the things that I need to. In other words, I don't know what size fines I need to charge to add a new life to an estate. I don't know um, anything about it. I don't have any paperwork. Um, and what's more, Wivelliscombe is a long way from, from um, Wells, and it's inconvenient for me. And, and that really is his argument for allowing to sell it. Um, and of course, he followed through on that because the money he got from selling the estate he reinvested in another estate in uh, what's now Yeovilton, so it was much more convenient to him. But I think that purchase was really set up by, by Bishop Beaton um, leasing the estate to his son. And that, I think, was a um, slightly morally doubtful thing to do at the time. Um, anyway, they got the estate, they built the estate, um, why should they sell it again? And the simple fact about that is it was debt. Um, Richard Beaton, to buy the estate in the first place, had borrowed very heavily on his marriage settlement. He borrowed just about every penny from his marriage settlement. He'd also borrowed um, from other people to finance the purchase of some of the other lands that were involved at the time. Um, and those were all from his estate. But then he did a whole load of other borrowing on one side, which he also charged against the same estate. 
And it appears that altogether he borrowed another 70,000 on the other side. So he had enormous debts. Now, in uh, 1832, I think it was, um, there was a kind of quasi-judicial committee set up um, consisting of the Lord Chancellor, the Attorney General, and one of the masters in Chancery and some solicitors who approached Beden and said, well, Mr. Richard Beden, you need to get your act together and sell this and pay off your debts. Um, I don't know how long, I mean, one has to surmise about a lot of this, there's no papers on a lot of it. Um, but there certainly was this committee, they certainly told Beaton he had to sell the estate. They told him it must be sold on public auction, and you can read that in the papers. So he put it up for auction in Wivelliscombe, um, and hardly any of it sold, just some bits around the fringes. And my suspicion is, is because he didn't actually promote that sale very well. Uh, he didn't really want to sell it. However, the committee then had yet another go at him and said, well, if you can't do it, um, perhaps your son can do it for you. And I think that's why the gift was made to William Frederick. And William Frederick just got on with the job and sold it straight away. So the central argument, I believe, is that Richard Beedon was in great debt and was forced to sell off the estate. And the way he did it was to sell it to Ashburn. So that's really the end of the story. And to recap, um, Bishop Law sold the estate to Richard Beden, but I think in many ways, um, because Bishop Beden had set the lease up with Richard Beden, Richard Beden then spent some years um, expanding the estate, in particular by buying the Southey and Somerville um, estates and adding them to it. But through these things, he got into, through his combination of purchases and presumably the way he lived, um, he got into really quite deep debt and was forced to dispose of the whole estate through his son. And subsequently, Ashburton, I believe, set up um, a trust which for 50 years did very well with the estate um, so that at the end of the 50 years, it could be sold off as individual farms, all of which were very successful in their own way. Anyway, that's the end of my story. Um, and I'd like to finish with a few words from uh, Lord Ashburton himself, the first Lord Ashburton, Alexander Ash uh, Baring, which is this. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, David. That was really interesting, quite fascinating. So uh, one of the things I found quite difficult to understand was about all the different sort of um, leases that there are. Um, yeah, copyhold leases, what were they? You did mention them a few times. Yes, okay, well a normal lease is for a period of time and you pay an amount of money at the end of the time the lease finishes. That's the way we see a lease today. They saw it in a different yes. way. They had leases that were for a period of time. They were typically, for individuals, they were 99 years. For manners, they were 21 years. And then, but they depended also on lives living through that period. So that mm. when you started the lease, you said you declared three lives. Yeah. And this is where I say it was father, mother, and eldest son. That was very often the way it was done. And yeah. their age. And if any one of them died two things happened, well, three things happened. One was you only had two lives left rather than three, so you were at greater risk. The second thing is you had to pay what was called a heriot, um, which was very often your best beast or a sum of money. That's small farms, it was the best beast normally. Um, and you had to pay a fine, a, a sum of money again, to add a new life. And the size of the fine depended on the age of the person, because if it was oh. somebody who was 90, <laughs> it wouldn't yeah, be very that much. that explains when you were talking at the very beginning about how um, uh, he had to pay, pay fines on all these lives. I couldn't mm. quite understand that. It was just a, it was a very different way of doing it to the way we do it now. 
But it was yeah. very much aimed at these small farms, you see, and yeah. families. So, does that help? Yeah, that's really quite helpful. Yes, yeah, Pines and Harriets. Yes. Um, where can we find you? Oh, you said you'd um, had quite a few papers published already. Where is it possible to find those? Well, I did one on part of this subject. Um, sorry, a, another aspect of the same subject, should we say, more on the on the reform of the church and, and this being taken as an example of the reason why there had to be reforms. Um, it was published uh, recently in the um, what's called Off the Record, which is the Record Society uh, twice a year newsletter. It's quite a long article in there about it. Yeah. Um, I'm doing one on, I've done one on um, the Stowells of Cottleston. Um, it's called the, I think it's called The Demise of the Family Stowell, um, which was published in. Uh, He's going to esoteric things, you understand. That went into um, uh, notes and queries for Somerset and Dorset. Right. Um, uh, these are kind of fairly deep in little historical things, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But nonetheless, it's very interesting if you're researching into it. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know, they're lovely. Oh, they're, they're just fascinating things. You find so much about so many strange things about people when you do this kind of research. And it's so hard to understand how people worked in history, isn't it? <laughs> it's all yeah, bit, so different from how we work nowadays. No, I've, I haven't actually published it yet, but I'm on the way to it. This one about the Perriam. So, I mean, the, the interesting yeah. thing about the Perriam was he was a what they call a cadet branch. The, the main branch stayed the other side of the county, but he came off here to Melbourne and married a lady here. Um, became a very successful lawyer. Uh, one of the things he did was with Canon Southey, we talked about just now, the pair of them bought the manor of Bishop's Lydiard um, from the Stowell family when the Stowell family went broke. <laughs> so, so you see how they tie up. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, bought the, they bought the entire manor and then split it up amongst themselves. Um, but the interesting thing about it was that John Perriam died young, um, well, 50, um, young by my circumstance, uh, but his wife took over from him. And his wife was just as dramatically exciting as he was. You know, she would, there's court cases with her appearing to go up because she had to try and recover all the money that was still owing him at the time he died and oh. finish cases for him and things like that, you know. And she picked up the whole thing and did it. And for a woman who has spent her life bringing up, she had six children, I think, you know, um, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, well, I don't know. I think women are quite seven, stable. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure they are, but don't forget, this was 17... He died in 1709. Ladies at that time weren't expected to do anything, but she went out and really fought her corner. You know, that's a, I find her quite exciting in that sense. Yeah, good girl. The well whole done. society was against that, you know. <laughs> well, so, thank that, you. So, that kind of thing that makes it... Enjoyable. Makes it really interesting, doesn't it? You find out yeah. a little bit about the people behind behind the history, I suppose. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. That was a really interesting talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. I did indeed. I hope everybody else did too. Good. Thank so, you. Thank you. So we have some more talks coming up on Zoom in Psalms. Um, on the 17th of November at half past seven, the Axbridge Archaeological and Local History Society are having a talk by Andrew Pickering about John Steinbeck's year in Somerset. So that'll be John Steinbeck, the writer. On the 20th of November at, in the morning, 11 o'clock, um, the Sands Archaeological Committee will be running part two of their Bronze Age Day. Um, on the 24th of November, Harp Tree Historical Society will present um, Later Avon Valley Copper and Brass Industry. So that's most interesting. And on the 9th of December, the Sands Natural History Committee are going to have a talk on the wildlife of St Kilda. Um, if any of these events take your fancy, don't forget to go to the Sands website and you'll be able to pick up a, an email address where you can find out how to sign on for these talks.
And don't forget, if you'd like to donate, there's a link to the SANS donate button under chat button here, um, or on the SANS website under donations. And of course, if you'd like to join SANS, just go to the website and you'll find out how to do it there. So that only leaves me to thank David for his excellent talk. And of course, the webinar team, Nathaniel, Tony and Harriet. And of course, to thank you for coming along. And hopefully we'll see you again at another SANS lecture. So thank you and goodbye.